go. Raffers, you want to go ahead and get started? Absolutely. Okay, uh, so let's get this show in the road, shall we? So, Joe, how are you feeling and what do you expect to get out of today's call? Um, feeling lucky to be here. I'm, I'm glad to see everybody. Uh, you know, it's really always uh, the highlight of my week. Um, so, uh, and today I'm looking to learn a little bit more about bonding, uh, specifically from Raffers. Uh, <laughs> So, um, you know, there's nothing like experiencing something uh, new and getting a maybe different perspective. So, uh, but uh, no, it's it's uh, it's great to see everyone. I feel pretty good. I feel a little bit a little bit run down, but I'm okay. I've got a lot of stuff going on uh, on the home front, but uh, I'm pushing through. So, uh, Kelly, you look great um how are you doing what would you like to take away from today uh well i am feeling a little bit better today but it's up and down uh what i want to get take away from today is the the concept of bonding so we'll see how we go and and tam the superstar <laughs> how are you going i saw your videos they were very good uh, thank you very much, Kelly. So good to see you back. I'm so happy. Yeah. Um, and thank you very much for that. There have, there have been a lot of things going on and uh, the world has opened up in Malaysia. And so the weekends are not exactly my own anymore. <laughs> so um, I really um, missed quite a, two weeks, I think, of, um, of our meets. And I feel like I've missed a lot. So I can't wait to get back here to hear uh, what else we are doing going to be taking away from uh, Bucky Fuller. Okay, right. So thank you very much. And uh, Susan, how do you feel? And uh, what is the takeaway today? What would you like to take away today? I am super happy to be here and connecting. I understand Steve's predicament about uh, the unpredictability of time. And uh, so happy to see each one of you. I would like to gain a deeper understanding and sense of connection um, when I have Kelly on, the thing that I always think about is how much I want to understand how to apply things because he's a master at that. Who else is left? You can go to John or, or Manu. Senior Butler, how do you feel? <laughs> what would you like to get out of today? Susan, muchas gracias. Um, I'm feeling great. I've had my walk by the river, so that's always a good start to the day. And I'm excited at the thought of something other than spheres and tetrahedra. But uh, <laughs> always good to learn more, always hoping to learn more. So I hope to come out of today knowing just a little more than I do now. Manu, how do you feel and what do you hope to take out of today? I'm just feeling kind of, I haven't had much sleep. You know, I'm, I'm going to really, I know I'm going to be sloppy during this call. For some reason, I didn't sleep a lot tonight. Anyway, I'm very happy that everybody's there and welcome back. Um, Kelly, you do great. And then uh, uh, what I expect is <coughs> the relationship between bonding and energy in motion. That's what I expect to take to probe more during and exchange during this call about and understand better. Uh, who's left? Uh, with Steve. Steve. Uh, Steve. Steve, Steve, how do you feel? What um, do you? Thank you. I feel grateful that uh, the system uh, very decentralized. <laughs> I'm at a family gathering. It went longer than I thought, and I'm remote. And so I'm delighted that Raffers is conducting this. And Manu, I hope that the um, and Kelly, I hope that the conversation is stimulating to you guys because I'm. <laughs> about bonding and I did a bunch of videos during the week to figure something out and I'll tell you this chemistry thing Susan I know you know you some know something about bonding and um, um, I'm just hoping to uh, learn a lot out of this and put it together with the teacher had tetrahedron thing what's really come over me the last few weeks is everything is energy everything and that when Isaac Newton came around he's the guy maybe Descartes started it 
but Isaac mm -hmm. Newton really solidified the fact that matter's over here and energy is <laughs> over there. And the truth of it is that there is no matter without energy and there is no energy without matter. And Bucky mm -hmm. gets to the source of the structures of that matter. And bonding is a key. So I'm anxious to learn about bonding. Uh, Nelson just showed in. Nelson, uh, do you have your microphone? I can't tell what's going on here. I can um, see Nelson on screen. No. Uh, I thought he came in. Mm, nope. All right. He well, he's not come in. So, okay. Oh. Yeah. yeah, he's in, but he's not fully activated, and somebody else is trying to come in now. So, Raffers, I think you're the only guy left then, unless we can get Nelson. Oh, oh this Nelson's one is here, here now. Yeah. Nelson's here. Um, and my thing says he has a microphone. Do you see that? Nelson, how are yeah. you feeling? And, and what do you expect out of this call today? And Raffers, if Nelson can't answer, why, uh, it's your turn. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. Well, I think I go because he hasn't seemed to be active yet. Anyway, so actually, well, I feel, I don't know how I feel actually. I feel surprised that I'll be running this call. <laughs> Anyway, and what I expect today is to, to demonstrate uh, what I learned once, that is the fact that you don't have to know anything as long as you show respect. <laughs> and also that we all know a little bit about something. So I'll use, I guess, so both, both things come in handy at this stage. So what I expect is again, is to, to support the call and make sure we get the most out of that, out of it. And then, um, I'm also glad that we are <clears throat> moving uh, again, particularly away from spheres and tetrahedra, because again, bonding relates nicely to what we have been studying. So, so let's get into that then. So, if Nelson is ready, Nelson, how do you feel? And what do you expect to get out of today's call? Thank you, Rafa. for this call. And uh, my speech today is uh, more about the uh, characteristic. Thank you. And, uh, no, every, everybody is gone, Nelson. So thank you. Okay. So, we, so we are ready to start then. So let's share screen yes, so I can show you my email. The thing is, I cannot make the text any larger. Uh, let's see how that works. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay. So it's not perfect. Well, but I guess we have to, to deal with that. If I can read, I'm sure everybody can. So, so Johnny, would you mind reading for us today again? Certainly. <laughs> okay, Synergetic. So, so read just the first paragraph, please. Okay. Synergetics, chemical bonds, omnicongruence, when two or more systems are joined vertex to vertex, edge to edge, or in omnicongruence in single, double, triple, or quadruple bonding, then the topological accounting must take cognizance of the congruent vectoral build-in growth. Okay. Good. Now explain okay, that to you. me. <laughs> Absolutely. <Yeah. clears throat> well, <clears throat> let's see, comments or questions about this paragraph from Bucky? <laughs> yes, please explain what it means to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <yeah>. <clears throat> okay. Well, <clears throat> yes, who wants to have a go? I... Joe, were you about to say something? I, I'm trying to figure out how to best explain edge to edge um, and and figure out how that means to what it means for a connection and omni congruence. Um, uh, and how that works with a topological accounting. Okay. Mm -hmm. I have Thank some you. ideas. Okay, oh, go, go ahead, ahead, Steve. Okay, go ahead. Oh, Manu. Oh. If I were home, I'd grab my magnets and I'd show you what edge-to-edge -edge bonding is. Here's edge-to-edge. -edge. There we go. Susan's got it right there. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Susan. And then and then show them vector-to-vector -vector bonding or vertex-vertex. You know, 
Yeah, vertex, vertex to vertex bonding. So there's your bow tie. That's vertex yeah. to vertex. And then the double bond. We can see, you know, the display. Uh, Rafes, can you? Let me pin. Yeah. Susan. Uh, no, it's not pinning. I don't know why. Now go to view in such a way that you view all the participants, because otherwise we just see in the speaker. Which Let is me it. see. Hold on a second. Let me see how I can do that. Uh, Is a short one. <laughs> That's a short one. Or oh, this one? No. Oh, at least we can see Susan. If she if she's talking, we can see what she's doing. Okay. If she's so here's vertex to vertex, and here is edge to edge. Now it's hinging with a double bond. Mm -hmm. And if it's only vertex to vertex, it uh, has motion around mm -hmm. each other while still keeping that vertex to vertex together. Um, I have not built a triple or quadruple bonding yet. But you can see it in general, Susan, if you take, you know, if you look at what it says, you see when two or more systems, mm -hmm. so you're talking about systems. And let's take the case as you were showing of tetrahedron, which is the simplest of a system and see. So the tetrahedron, can, you can have exchange of energy or bonding via vertex, via edge, or face to face, okay. for example. So let me yeah. see here. Here's face to face. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now it looks like a diamond. Yeah, okay, so that, that would be triple. It'd be yep. triple, yes. Because there's three bonds. Oh, so the, four, the fourth one is that you can have a tetrahedron coming into another tetrahedron, but perpendicularly to it ah. in a precessive way. The core of it will be quadri bonded. Let's see if I can. Let me take a minute to build that. <laughs> hmm. So the other thing, Manu, what you just said is exchange of energy. And so uh, you said yeah. exchange of energy. So when you say that, I think about each one of these little tiny balls, the little dots as being of an energy point. And so we could actually extract some of those points as we do the bonding to kind of uh, structuralize, um, to be able to think about the, the energy efficiency. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Yeah. I, I would say either, either, you know, I would not even say extreme energy, I would say share of energy. I think is a better word. Right. Because when you have vertex to vertex, if you take two tetrahedra, you bring them together, you have to take away your magnet, you have to take away one of the, one of the balls away in such a way that. Yes. Yeah. These stick together really well. <laughs> um, so that was one of the things that I was thinking about the efficiencies of nature before. So there's the two balls at the vertex, but I could sneak one of them out and they could share a node, a ball. And then you would have this conservation of energy. So there's just one ball in between. And that would, in some ways, I think that gives you something left over, which is this other ball which could start another cycle. Mm. So that was an epiphany I had earlier this year. Mm, wow. I totally agree. And if you look at a chart, I think I can show you one here if I'm going to go ahead and share and steal the share. Um, and I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to show you a chart of what. Um, Let me stop my share so you can share, Steve. Oh, oh no, you have captured it already. I, yeah, I, You're ready. I, go I ahead, go I ahead. Can, all right, good. So let me think here. Now I'm going to share my screen.
Wow. You guys see my orange circles? Did you see them? Yes. For a second. For, for a second. second, yes, we did. All right, good. Well, then I'm going to go over. So when you, and can you hear go. me now? There we are. And we can hear can you. Hear we can actually now? see now the sphere. Sitting. Okay. So this idea, dropping that ball is critical to those two tetrahedra because that's what creates the valence or the union. Something is missing. And when so two atoms connect, this is your standard view of how atoms share electrons. There has to be uh, atoms that do not have, that are totally balanced. I wish I could explain this, but I've watched several videos. There are some that are totally inert, the noble gases. They're absolutely, um, they are uh, succinct in themselves and they do not blend with anything. They're, they don't cooperate with anything. They're on the okay. right side of the element scale. Go ahead, Susan. We call them non-reactive. Yes, non-reactive, noble gases. They're on the right side of the element scale. And over on the left side, these are highly reactive because they are missing electrons in, in their outer shells. And so they are therefore either attracted, they're attracted to other atoms. And so uh, these tetrahedra, when they combine, we're kind of emulating the fact that one of those balls drops out and they connect, that shows a valent bond or a covalent bond. And that's where Bucky's talking about they bond either at the vertex or at the edge. Mm -hmm. I don't know what, what the difference is between vertex and edge in terms of these standard models. So vertex to vertex is going to be a single bond mm -hmm. and edge okay. is going to be a double bond. A hinge. Yes. I'm trying to make my magnets do a triple bond or a quadruple bond. So face I'm going to stop, stop sharing so you can see that. But, but Steve, it was yeah. very interesting. I would like uh, okay, but you you can start because well, can there was a back. Back that was very good. I can if bring them back. Again, can you? Can yes, share it. again, please. It's All right. very, very. Be glad to do. All right. Um, let me see. Where was I? It's up here. There we go. Go ahead, Manu. Okay. If you look, you know, at that reaction there, you have the two hydrogen and then an oxygen. Now, if you look at the representation of oxygen, on the outer perimeter of it, there's only six electrons, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And we know that that electron, that atom is twice negative. Oxygen free is twice negative. Mm -hmm. It has two electrons missing. Right? In the outer shell. To yes, fill in the, the outer, outer shell. shell. Mm -hmm. For it to be complete, you needed eight. Remember, two to the power of something. You needed eight there. You don't have it. So, so what happened there is that you have that electron, that hydrogen, that has only one, and uh, the other hydrogen, they come together to fill that. And now if you look at the right-hand representation. The first thing that you see is that the total charge of it is zero, the resulting electric charge of the atom of water is zero, right? You had minus two plus two, that is zero. That's what makes the stable structure. Secondly, if you're looking at that representation, why do you go away? Sorry, there we go. Okay, if you're looking at that representation also, when you have the atom of hydrogen, you see the two bonding is like a, a earring of a lady or something of a sort. You see, you see, you see, you see the double bonding and you know that in play there because you have the two bolts, which are the two hinges that you can see, and you can imagine that that. That, that atom is actually playing on a hinge, you know, like, <laughs> how does it turn in according to an axis? Does it make sense? In yeah. fact, that example there shown is what's called polar covalent bonding. If that, yeah. might, that polar idea might have something to do with it, because down below there's an example of just covalent bonding. 
But what we're looking at with water is polar covalent bonding. Well, what, 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 what is also important to understand is that on the left hand side, you had something that is in all likelihood is gas, right? You have oxygen and you have yes. hydrogen. Yes. And yes. On the right hand side, you have a liquid. We know that at normal temperature, temperature that thing it is stable as a liquid. So the notion to me, when you look at the right hand side of that, the stable side equation, the notion of hinge is very well in there. It's like two flaps, the, the, the hydrogen, if you, if you had that in a, how would I say, maybe on a plane representation, it's like two ears, two flaps, like, like that would turn according to an axis. Mm -hmm. You have hydrogen, you know, the left, I mean, the, the one on the top and the one at the bottom. It's like hydrogen hinging onto the oxygen. Yep, that's what it is. Yeah. Okay. So that on what Raphael is doing, on the left hand side, that is supposed to be oxygen is is a bigger, is mm -hmm. heavier than the hydrogen, but you have that that relationship there. Mm -hmm. So and let me just add that to Bucky, an atom is a system. It, it, can I, correct me if I'm wrong. To Bucky is an atom is a system. So an, an oxygen atom is one system, and a hydrogen atom is another system. Yeah. And so yes. we have three tetrahedrons coming together three tetrahedrons coming together in a double bond in order to create oxygen, which now becomes a, a system. And that's basically what we read in that first paragraph. I do believe if we go back and read the first paragraph now, it'll mean something more than it did before. Are we ready to leave this graphic behind? Yes. Uh, yeah, but before we do that, we could, if, if, if uh, Susan can show us the combination of two tetrahedra coming together. Because that shows again okay. quadruple bonding. So Susan, if you can show, I know you need another one. I mean that's single bond. It's the vertex. Yes. Edge to edge. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> fly away. Well, see, huh. It should actually be sharing that edge. So basically, There's face to face. Yeah. When they when they share, actually they become you drop the balls. Yeah. And, and the edges the of one and side. the extra edges, exactly right. Yeah, exactly right. And and, and that's what it will bond. The stiffness, I'm having trouble. This is our triple bond. I'm sorry, our quadruple bond imploding mm -hmm. one tetrahedron into another, like a Merkaba. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you, Susan. Okay, so, so let's read. Let's read that first paragraph. paragraph let me again. just go back. Yeah, let me just yeah. go back to the text. Uh, where is it? Oops, oops. Now I lost it. Oh my god. Uh, let me get the email again. Sorry. Okay, good. Let me share screen now. Oops, sorry. Let me get back. Get back to the email. Now, can we all see it now? Yes. Can you see the text? Yes. Okay, good. So let's go into the next paragraph, please, Johnny. <laughs> Johnny Butler. I'd like to read that first paragraph again and see if it makes again, it Again, okay, let's read the first one again and let's see what it, uh, now it's clear after all the discussion we just had. Or Johnny doesn't seem to be available, so. Yeah, I'm available, I'm available. Okay, okay, can you read again, please, the first paragraph? Yep. Synergetics, chemical bonds, omnicongruence, when two or more systems are joined vertex to vertex, 
edge to edge or an omnicongruent single, double, triple or quadruple bonding, then the topological accounting must take cognizance of the congruent vectoral building growth. Stopping there or moving on? No, no, stop, stop there for a second. So what I'm, I'm trying to break down each individual kind of concept in here. So we talked a lot about topology that's way different than topography because obviously each one of those systems with their bonding would have a different topography. And I'm, as I'm thinking about them having a topology which is omni-congruent, so it means omni meaning always, Congruent meaning going in the same direction, same ratio of relationships. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm thinking right now is about Bucky talking about the tetrahedron as the most elemental structure and the vector equilibrium as the most expanded structure. Mm -hmm. And yet they would both be omni- congruent in their mm -hmm. topology. And I think that that would still be the case even as Bucky talked about collapsing his big expanded vector equilibrium down into the quadruple bond and then it expanded on the other side of that event horizon. Susan, you say congruence has the connotation of going in the same direction you pronounce that yeah. word right help yes. me refine that what, what is it what is it socially that you represent to me it's cooperating system cooperating to achieve something systems cooperating when you cooperate you share resources in other words you create bonds we share so you have, yes you have several systems it's like if you take the analogy of flow of, you have rivulets, you have rivulets that flow together. For example, if they are on the same version of a mountain system, they are likely to flow together to form a bigger river, further downstream, right? Mm -hmm. But if they were on different version, they have same origin, but on different basins, they will flow away from each other. They will go into different basins. They will contribute differently. So you have here what is called omnicongruence in single, double, triple, or quadruple bonding is that how do you share that energy in the most effective way to achieve what you want to achieve? If, if it is for me, if it is, for example, if it is conveying water, I will share energy in a, in a double bonding, bond, bonding way because water is not compressible. I'm going to have my door that takes water like this and flip it over to the other side. So it achieves better that all. If it is for, in terms of uh, combining, for example, um, uh, how will I say it? I was going to take the example of a single, of a single, single bonding. I guess. That would be that, that would be gas. But I was as I was looking for something for a utility of it, you know, to explain what it is. We we get a lot of utility out of compressing gases because it's because as they would expand, they do work uh, potentially. Um, Kelly is the, the master here because in mm -hmm. his advanced business, he works with both pneumatic and hydrologic mm -hmm. systems. And I want to point out, Susan, that that expansion is because more energy is put into the system. The expansion is usually created by heat, uh, either heat gathered from light, from photons, from infrared, or heat generated by a Bunsen burner or an engine or of the electric motor that's put to it. Now, Kelly could say more about that, but the system expand, the gas expands because it has more energy and it starts to condense as the atoms slow down, they lose energy. 
So the cooler you make a system, the the less active it is, the less energy that, it has, and the more stable it is. Okay. I'll pause. Yes, and there is this intimate relationship between temperature and pressure. Mm -hmm. Um, and so you have to many many different functions involve changing one mm. at uh, the expense of another, and sometimes you need both. Like to to make atmospheric nitrogen turn into ammonia for fertilizer or for explosives, you need both incredibly high temperatures and high pressure. But Susan, what are you just said there? I think to me, you say something very important. You can't talk about bonding without referring to the boundary conditions. Absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so whatever structure, local structure or combination that you do, it is dependent, is a function of what is at play at the boundary. That's why we usually say, you know, change starts at the boundary. And I so, will say that so, I... so you can create, you can create a high pressure without invoking the notion of restricted volume or putting more into a limited space. Mm -hmm. And that's where you have the relationship between pressure, volume, <coughs> sorry, and temperature. Um, yeah, to me also, it also relates to um, the, the practical application of the steam engine when it comes to how we use single bonding, that is uh, <clears throat> gas or, or steam to create, to actually create energy. And when you come to double bonding and we use liquids and then you get then hydraulic power. And you can see that the combination of those two have been, have enabled us as a species to do enormous things and how to master and, and apply energy in different ways. So in Kelly's business, what he learned about hydraulics and, and again, you, you need to create a boundary as well. In both cases, you need to create a boundary you want to create and master and channel energy to make it more effective or efficient. And, uh, and those, those two in combination also have a, a tremendous applications. But that also say, you know, if you take that, Rafa's, are you frozen or am I the one? Can anybody hear me? Yep. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not the problem is Rafa's. So what I was saying is that in terms of, uh, in terms of, if you bring that to the social realm, what is important here is that, you know, there is always at play, compression and expansion, right? Is always at play. Right. And in between those motions. Here we have, have uh, Russia and Ukraine and boundaries and compression and expansion. Yes. But but there will be there will be at some point a stability that will be found. That is a kind of structure. These things are bouncing, bouncing, bouncing until there is a discrete stable condition. Equal. That is that is anti-entropy for a mm. while. For as long as the conditions at the boundary are going to allow it. And that's why there is a constant, if you want to preserve that, there is a constant need for you to be aware of it first and do, secondly, do things that tend to maintain it. That's where the term maintenance comes from. You have a system, you have to maintain it. You have to understand what it is, and then you have to maintain. You have to have a proactive uh, uh, system and processes to maintain, that is to have your anti-entropy as durable as possible. How does calibration factor into this? 
How's what? Calibration. Or does it? You can only devise any system you can calibrate. That is the first, in my opinion, that's the first thing that you have to have. You have to be able to measure something. Otherwise, you don't have information. So Joe, in the standard, when we were learning about chemistry and we would look at the energy that's involved in some of these boundary, uh, that bonding relationships, it would always stipulate a certain temperature and a certain pressure. So it, and uh, it's funny because you talk about the scientific method and almost every experiment tries to isolate as many variables as possible. So you could try and look at a relationship between one variable and another variable. It's impossible to do, but we try our very best to set the boundary conditions. We, you know, we match the participants. We, we look at what the control is. Um, we try to account for those maintaining the boundary conditions. And what does the boundary condition mean? It means dividing. Okay. Setting a boundary means dividing in order to have clarity. Like you say, in the scientific experiment, you try to have, say for example, control temperature, control pressure, control this and that, in order for you to be able to observe some expected stable rate of relationship within that boundary. That, that's the way I see it. You know, it's not, I don't see like bonding as a bond standalone. Like, like gas, yes, we can talk about gas as gas but you have to see it within the context of interaction and things changing, actually even changing state. That's to me has much more impact and significance and, uh, and help in understanding things, the way they work and, de and designing you know, applying those than just some kind of sterile understanding of what bonding is. And that's why in, the, in that first paragraph that we read, systems coming together, interacting in, uh, you call it omnicongruence, right? Is that the word that you use? Mm -hmm. You know, single, double, triple, and quadruple is to me very important. It is systems that are interacting. If, if I can say, uh, when I think about it, I think of um, a nuclear blast. And at the center of a nuclear blast is 14 PSI, which you, you think that's not 14 PSI you know, is very, very, very small. Yet look what it can do mm. at the center of a nuclear blast. And it, it takes in and, and you have this bubble. And then from that, you have different ratings. Like if you look at the next level up from, from the nuclear blast, it might be six PSI. Then uh, it goes out further, it might be um, five PSI, four, until it finally echoes away. But in that, you can see everything that you're talking about because it's all happening. Everything happens, it's congruent. You may not like the nuclear blast, but it demonstrates you know, you can you can actually see uh, the the various zones or the various boundaries that happen yeah. from the nuclear blast. And believe you know when you think of fourteen psi, if I put it in a hose, 
it would barely get a squirt. But uh, put in a nuclear blast, it will knock a, a, a large building down. So it depends on circumstance. You know, where, where is it happening? Where, what's going on? So to me, uh, you know, working with pressure, as Manu says, we, we can uh, get pressures up to 50, 60,000 PSI, and they'll have a diameter of an eighth of a PSI, or an eighth of an inch to contain it. So it's the boundary that contains it. So when you start to look at it like that, you start to see very different relationships between pressure and everything else. But I can tell you that when you're looking at um, taking 60,000 PSI and containing it, the fittings that you have to use for that are enormous. Exactly. And, but they hold a very, very small space. But to anchor them to anything takes a hell of a lot of, you know, uh, if, if, if it's an eighth that I'm doing, it's probably a three inch nut that's holding it that screws into it and its seat face and everything else that goes with it. But when you look at it like that, you can see all the, all the different happenings, if you like, um, between the relationships. And I, uh, I think it depends on relationship that you're dealing with. So. As, as congruent as I can be right now, that's the way I see it. Rafael? Yeah, I'm back. Yeah, sorry, I just lost my internet connection. But I'm now connected using my mobile phone as a hub, so good to be back. Uh, okay, so I guess we we can continue now, shall we, with the next paragraph? Are we ready yes. to do that? Okay, yes. let me share my screen again. Okay. <clears throat> Voila. Oops, let me just go down, scroll down this one. No, it's not moving. Uh, what is that? Yeah, now it's not, oh, now it's responding. Okay, here we are. Okay. Okay, great. Let's okay, go into the paragraph, please, Johnny. Yes, okay. Single bond. In a single bonded or univalent aggregate, all the tetrahedra are joined to one another by only one vertex. The connection is like an electromagnetic universal joint or like a structural engineering pin joint, it can rotate in any direction around the joint. The mutability of behavior of single bonds elucidates the compressible and load distributing behavior of gases. Okay. Thank you, Johnny. So then, let me demonstrate that. You see, this is two tetrahedra. So there will be a single bond. I think we demonstrated this before. Mm. Yep, that's the bow tie. Yeah, exactly. And we could have more, but this is, but they all connect to one one vertex, basically. There's also something that it says here, is mm -hmm. like an electromagnetic universal mm -hmm. joint. Mm -hmm. See, is it still there? See, see there? You know, it is it is like a, a torus, isn't it? Do you see what I'm saying? I want to, but I don't yet. 
Well, I mean, the energy can flow in all directions. That's why I say, you know, it is like an electromagnetic uh, 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 universal joint. And that also explain the, the fact that you can distribute energy through gas to a whole system. They pass everywhere because vertex to vertex. So it's flowing radially all over. Energy is flowing through that radially. That's actually what makes the bow tie. Because if, if a bow tie is two systems that come together at one, at, one, at one point, at one edge, energy is flowing in all directions, radially, in and out. That's the way it goes. So that's the very definition of a torus, isn't it? And that was what we looked at uh, about uh, energy moving around the wires. Yeah, but here, what you're saying is that if you take one tetrahedron, one tetrahedron, right, mm -hmm. is the concave tetrahedron is energy flowing in, converging to that. The convex tetrahedron is energy flowing out. Mm -hmm. So when energy flow in and out, it goes around and come back. Was, isn't that? That so makes it work. Yeah. Yes, that's what I'm saying. And that's what you see the distribution, you know, the, 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 and you see that the compressive and low distribution behavior of gases. Because energy permeates that local medium all over and distributes it there. Say for example, Temperature in the medium is distributed. Temperature is distributed by the friction of gases, the friction of those single bonds. That will create the temperature to rise. And you take a date locally, that temperature will be uniform. It is distributed, uh, how would I call it, uh, spherically around there in a uniform way. I'm going to go ahead because I think this Taurus thing is absolutely critical to see. Um, here's an example. One of the best animations I found of toral energy. If, if any animation to me looks like Bucky's precession, this is it. It's everything happening all at once in every direction. Yeah. Now this shows a collapsing, but while it's collapsing, it's expanding. But we couldn't mm -hmm. see that. So the animation shows one, so several aspects working in unison, but it's actually, while it's collapsing, it's expanding. And while it's expanding, it's collapsing. So it just looks like a ball of energy. But well, you have a torus there. You see that? Mm -hmm. Wow. There's you another can see really... the tie appearing in both directions. Yeah. I'll show you some other cool examples of tor toral energy, but I think when I look at the tetrahedron, when I look at my magnets, these magnets are just, th this is just a way to show vector energy that's actually happening like that torus. Mm -hmm. these, these vectors are that torus. These edges are that torus. It's all energy. But in order to understand it with, our, with my two-dimensional mind, Bucky says, hey, Look at the tetrahedron, and you know you have your basic structure. And that's going to be stable. And, and uh, when it happens, when you start pulling these things apart, I mean, like, here, this was a bow tie. But all of a sudden, one of the bonds broke, and another bond broke. And now you've got these guys out here look, going crazy, looking for stuff. Mm-hmm. And that, and that energy is seeking some valence, some way to bond. It's, it's always looking for something. And the more energy that's in the system, the more heat is in that system, the more active it's going to be looking for stuff and the more volatile it's going to be. And the cooler it is, the slower it's going to be and the more stable it's going to be. Anyway, I just, this torus is critical. This is the dot, you know? This, yeah, so yeah, this, this guy yeah. right here, yeah. that's mm -hmm. that guy over there. Yeah. May I suggest something? Socially, 
or let's say you have an organization, right? You have a, let, let's just take the example of John and his firm. Let's say that your firm has 20 associates. Beautiful. Okay. Now, from time to time, you will need to have one-to-one -one with an associate. But there will be a time when you need a convention. That is, everybody sitting in a hall and somebody present. Do you see the association of that and bonding? I see the one-to-one -one as alike, uh, let's call it a quadruple bonding in that you are communicating very intensely to one person something and you are coming out of there, you expect, your expectation is to come out of that meeting understood completely in a way that is very solid in any detail what you wanted to communicate. Now, when you want to have to talk to the firm, firm wise, you put all of the associates and maybe the support staff in an editorial and you communicate. There is more like a gas that is distributing a certain energy or space wide. I don't know if it makes any sense. Yeah. I think that's a good analogy. Let me, let's, uh, this is a system, right? Therefore, mm -hmm. this could be this. Mm -hmm. It just depends on how I'm calibrating. Isn't that right? Yes. Yeah. Or, this is probably more likely this, right? The double mm -hmm. tetrahedron with the octahedron implied inside. Yeah. In fact, most sacred traditions, Kabbalah, Native American, the Norse mystic religions, they all have the octahedron showing the seven directions, which manifests the six degrees of freedom for each person. And so this, I love it because now we come back to the, if I'm on one-on-one -on -one with my employee, if I say, here's what I want to do, do you want to do it? The guy says, yes or no, I got nothing because that dude is a tetrahedron. He's got more energy over there or that lady has more energy. And if I just ask one silly question, I'm better off to say to this guy, hey, if you had this problem, how would you solve it? And then stand back and see how that energy guy is going to put it all together. And I need to realize I'm not just talking to one thing here. That this guy's got other aspects too. And the more I connect with this person, this lady, this guy, the more I bond. I can bond at one level or I can bond at two levels. You know, it's kind of like I have an employee at work. They're good guys. They're a teammate. I bring them home and have dinner with them. Now I've created a new bond, right? Maybe, maybe I'll marry one of them. I don't know. Maybe that's another bond. I don't I don't know what that would look like. That's got to look something like this with an atomic explosion. In it. <laughs> that's what Wayne did. In a factory, <laughs> the factory where you have a certain process and a certain order for things to be done, that is almost, I don't know how many, you have to lock everything clear, neat. Because one mistake bamboozle the whole stuff. Like if, if Susan is going with a team in surgery, there's no room for a mistake. Is there, Susan? You go in there, even if an emergency, with all the cases that you've been through, you have rehearsed. You can't be asking for a scalpel and somebody send you something else. Or you can't afford to leave something, a needle into somebody's body. Oh, I don't know what, I'm not, I'm just saying things. But, but, but what I'm trying to say is that in that context, everything has to be synchronized. Everything has to be related multiple ways in a way that is locked into delivering a result. Right? 
Now, if you are playing a lab with some stuff, you can have more flexibility, right? You can try here, it doesn't work, you try something else. You don't have that latitude when you are in a, in a surgical room. Does it make sense, Susan? So, so if you want to do an, your example, the manual is breaking the different boundaries. Yes. Basically. So if you want to be an effective surgeon, mm -hmm. you better be a prepared surgeon. There's no way to be an artistic surgeon. No way. Well, I hope my surgeon's an artist. I hope they're I hope they're a robot until it's time to make that. Tell the tell the, the a vector equilibrium goes ape shit, and it's time for that mm -hmm. surgeon to make an intuitive artistic decision on what they're going to do next. What do you think about that, Susan? <laughs> Both are required. During the preparation, they can be artistic as they want. Once in the theater, they have to be a robot. Really, they have to be a program. You know that is say if there is this reaction from the patient, this is what I do. Right? Manu, it would seem to me that you're talking about an evolved, mm -hmm. but really when you're looking at it as non-evolved, it doesn't matter. It's going to happen anyway. Yeah. <laughs> That's for sure. You know, it's like the more you, the more you say this is going to happen, the, the, this comes from what we know. Right. And as we know it, we label it. And as we label it, then we can keep doing it in a certain way. Mm. But what happens when that label doesn't work? Yeah. Well, we have to change. It's a pattern. That, that, that now becomes your bonding. Yes. That's, that, that's your, your, your single bond is always searching for yes. new things. Your double bond is doing that, your triple bond, your quad, quadruple bond, they're all going to happen whether we like it or not. Hmm. And to, to um, say um, it, it's us, it's, it's the human race that says there's a way to do it and we'll do it this way. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm really, or if we're ready, I'm stoked on this Taurus thing because Joe asked about calibration. What does calibration have to do with this? And it seems to me it has everything to do with it. It's just like what Kelly was just now saying. We take a look at a situation, we have this past experience, we give it a label and we, we keep doing that system and it'll keep working until it doesn't. Yeah, exactly. And then what, it, what when it doesn't? Well, it, we weren't calibrating properly because if I was calibrating properly, I maybe could have predicted that. But I can't predict it because it's not part of my experience yet because I'm a freaking human being and my brain is trapped in the past. I'd like to share some more. Yeah, but before, before, I, before you I, mention that, Steve, I, important I, word. Okay. We, we cannot predict. We can be predictive. Yeah. Yes, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. That in the process of applying, you can start seeing that by calibration, that is no more working. It's not going to yeah. work at right. certain point. Cool. So here are different ways to calibrate toral energy. You ready for this? Here's, here's one right there. That's, this is the same as that other thing that was squishing up and down. It's just this is calibrated differently, right? And then here's another one. <clears throat> this is that same torus. It's just calibrated differently. Yeah. And if I'm used to this. Wow. And suddenly this happens, I'm screwed, <laughs> you know? unless I've been accurately predictive. If I understand the bonding principles, I can be predictive but I can, because I can say, oh, under certain conditions, this will become this. Mm -hmm. Right. And then here's another one. This is the same thing. This, this kind of looks at the toral energy from the pole. Yeah. So I thought those were kind of helpful. 
And I've got sure. one of these two where those come from. But calibration is really it, it, well, all it is because I think that's why Bucky wrote his books yeah. <laughs> was to help us start to calibrate. <laughs> yeah. And also, you showed that I can see triangles as well. Oh, yeah. And tetrahedra as well. Yeah. <laughs> It's all triangles. I have another one here. I'll show you in just a second. I'm all excited. <laughs> if you can't measure, you can't do anything. Yeah. Maybe you can do something once, but you will not be able to repeat it. Yeah. That's the point. If you want to repeat something, yes. you have to calibrate it. Yeah, exactly. But if you don't want to repeat it, just let it happen. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Because it probably will. <laughs> there's Murphy's law, right? If anything can happen, it will happen. Yeah. And then there's O'Leary's law. O'Leary's law is higher than Murphy's law. O'Leary's law is Murphy was an optimist. <laughs> you get it, O'Leary? <laughs> okay, good. Okay, now. Okay, you have to share now your screen so we can continue with the next yeah, paragraph. Yeah, what paragraph are we are? Thank you, rappers, for um, sitting my in. Doubles. My, 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 double the, my yeah, family we doubles. My family appreciates the... you. Oh, thank you for that. <laughs> so it's going to double bond then. Johnny double was bond. helping with the reading. Go ahead, Johnny. If two vertexes of the tetrahedra touch one another, it is called double bonding. The systems are joined like an engineering hinge. It can rotate only perpendicularly about an axis. Double bonding characterizes the load distributing but non-compressible behavior of liquids. This is edge bonding. Now I'm totally confused. Yeah, that got me too. I was okay till I got to characterizing load distributing but non-comprehensible behavior of liquids. Evidently, liquid bonding must be Edge bonding. Yeah. What like, about load? Okay. What okay. about load distributing? Like when you put pressure on a confined system of water, the pressure builds throughout that whole system. That's why you use hydraulic hoses. Okay, but let's 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 do this way. Let's assume that water were comp that a liquid was compressible. Let's just assume it. Right? If you assume that, and then it is hinge, then it's no more the hinge is going to break because it's going to change direction. Compression means change of a gradient. Are you with me? You're no more going to maintain, the edge of it is no more going to maintain the circular, the circular outline. If it is, I'm assuming here that a liquid were compressible. The double bonding, the consequence of it is that the double one bonding will break. Do you get that? Yeah. If a liquid is compressible, that is, it is in your, in, it is changing direction basically. So compressible means that the, the gradient has changed depending on the force that is, say for example, when you take, when you take a gas in a balloon and you press around it, it compresses. When you relax, it expands, right? It means that the gradient distribution of a gas into the system, the gradient is the same in all direction, but compared to one direction is broken. Whereas in water, when you take a liquid, you say it's non-compressible, you maintain that you say you are maintaining, say the, the axis, the poles. You have the poles that is constant and you have then circulation of energy at a constant rate by it, around it. So it's not compressible.
Yeah, I'm having, I'm, if two vertices of a, of the tetrahedra touch one another. So tetrahedra is plural. Yes. So if two vertices of the tetrahedra touch one another, it is called double bonding. Evidently, that that's is not double it. bonding. No, no, it's not. Oh. No. Well, how do you get two vertices of the tetrahedra to rotate touch? it until you have put it? Touch now. Back. Yeah. It's a hinge. The systems are joined like an engineering hinge. It can rotate only perpendicularly about an axis. Yes. Yeah. I would if say- you compress, If you compress, it's no more rotating perpendicularly. Steve, let well, that's only a single touch. bond. That's a single bond, Steve. Yes. Let a whole edge touch, Steve. Okay, I have an idea, Steve. I have an idea, please. Just hold up the way we're holding now. I like the edge bond. I get the edge bond, I think. No, 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 no. Hold on with a double, with the two, the two side by side in a hinge. Okay, now, now bring the one edge of the triangle together. Well, you do that with yours, Susan. And can you okay. do that easily? I mean, I'm happy to do it. Okay, but if so you do it, we can compare. You are. Go like that. Okay, now, Susan, right. Hold it up again. Mm -hmm. It keeps wanting to be triple bonded. So that's double bonded, okay. right? No, wait, Steve. Just one second. Steve, what do you mean? Oh. Susan, hold it, not Steve. Susan. Yeah, I'm there. Okay, what do you call compression? In regard to this thing, what do you call compression? Compression would mean that one of the, the yellow tetrahedron, for example, is moving out in an angular, is moving like instead of just rotating, it is moving out of that, that axis of rotation. Okay. It can't yes. without breaking the bond. Yes. Okay. So, so if you do it, you have to break the bond. So, so if, if it were compressible, you have one structure moving away from another structure to create the space or to reduce the space. It wouldn't be constant anymore. It will be, the double bond will be broken because you have now an angle of the two edges because it's moving that way. It's moving. Compressing means displacing volume without, with changing the total volume inside. That's what it means to compress. You're decreasing the volume or you're expanding. Whereas liquid, you don't know if the conditions that created the liquid are constant, it's not going to change. So are you complete there? Because I'd, I'd like to go back to 931.2. Single bond, a single bond or univalent one position aggregate, all the tetrahedra, two of them, are joined to one another by only one vertex. Yes. This connection is like an electromagnetic universal joint or like a structural engineering pinpoint. It can yes. rotate in any direction around the joint. The mutability of behavior of single bond elucidates the compressible and load distributing behavior of gases. Yes. Now we go to the double bond. Bam. Right? Yes. Good if two vertices if two vertices of the tetrahedron touch one another, it is called double bonding, like Susan said in the first place. <laughs> the systems are joined. But, 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 but Steve, Go ahead. Steve, when you are holding there, when you hold it like that, there is no way that you can change the form of that structure. That's right. You can only okay. rotate it. It will always be two tetrahedra that are just turning like that. Yeah, but but don't we drop one of these balls? No, the energy that is inside is not going to be distributed differently. In that system, the new system that you have, you have energy in, right? That form that system. 
when you put the two together, it will never change. The total of that energy is going to be constant. And that's the reason why it is not compressible. Because if you compress it, you increase the energy in the system. If you, if you expand it, you release energy in the, from the system. To compress anything, any system, you have to add energy to it. And, and to apply energy, pressing it at the boundary. That's, that's the most sense of compressing. To expand, you have to release energy, release the bond. I, I would think of it like this. If you have a single bond and I take my finger and I take it down and down and down and down, I can keep compressing, compressing the gases around my finger. Yes. But if, if I take the same finger and I put it in a double bond and now I stick it in water, the water moves around the finger. The finger yes. doesn't do anything else. So it goes in and the water goes all around the finger because it's non-compressible. But where it compresses, um, you can keep compressing down and down and down with the finger. But if you take the finger and stick it into water, the water goes around the finger. That makes sense. So in a single bond, do I lose one of those balls? I thought I did. Yes. I lose a ball. Yes. Yeah. They share it. They share. All, all, all it so, says is, is you don't need it, Steve. Yeah. And so when I go into a double bond, I should be losing two balls. Yes because they'd be sharing each other. Yes. It's a higher energy event. <laughs> I got the thin magnets. Thin magnets are terrible. They don't do anything they're supposed to. <laughs> Over there, I got my thick magnets, but they're all built into structures that I don't want to screw up. <laughs> I got to buy another game. Okay. Is everybody complete? If one other demonstration you can do to understand single bonding and double bonding is you get a balloon full of air and you compress it with one finger, the balloon will actually support your pressure. You try it with water, the balloon will explode. You see, because of the non-compressibility of water, of the, of the liquid. So that's another, at least it's another way to, to understand it again, again in feeling it. You are more kinesthetic, I guess. And that, that, that relates to Kelly's example about, you know, how you put pressure on air with one finger and, and what happens when you put the same finger into, into liquid. The liquid goes around your finger because it's non-compressible. At least that's my take on that. Comments, questions? Since application, you... application, steam engine for the single bonding. Yes. And a dam for the double bonding mm -hmm. or conveyance of water. When you convey water, you come, you pull it, say for example, you have, uh, I would not call it a turbine, you have uh, something, you have, uh, you have, you have uh, a cylinder and on the cylinder you have plates that are perpendicular to the water. And what you do to move water from one level to the other, you just convert, you turn that axis into the lower level, the lower container, and you will take water and drop it at the top. You get what I'm trying to say? That is the application of it. That the fact that you know the liquid is not is not compressible. Compressible, yes. You can conserve the volume. Mm -hmm. You can conserve the volume in motion. That's why if you conserve the volume in motion, 
you conserve also energy in motion. It means that when you apply, when you apply pressure onto that volume, it is taken all the way, minus friction. And if you design the way that friction along your tubing is lowest as possible, it will convey, that's how we function basically. My blood pressure is, uh, you know, it is, it is good and it is stable and it's normal where the friction of my blood liquid circulating in my vein and arteries is minimal. And it results into a measurement that is normal for a human like this. You go to see a doctor, you control your stuff, they take your blood pressure and they say you're normal or you're not normal. That's the principle. We are in our system, the blood is complete hydraulics. That's what it is. Since we're since I'm beating this Taurus thing to a pulp, uh, I'll share I'll share a couple more Tauri with you. Here's a good Taurus. Yeah, that's interesting, huh? Yeah. I mean, if we talk Bucky's precession, like anything can freaking happen, right? We have spin, orbit, we have expansion, contraction, torque, and reverse torque. We got everything going on at once. Here's another one. There's another torus right there. Oh, wow. that's, how, that's how electromagnetic energy flows around magnets. Here's another torus. Voila. Oh, wow. Hmm. And then my final Taurus for this evening, maybe, is this guy here. <laughs> Except I didn't like this, so I actually built a slide where I put that one there and then put a copy of it flipped over. So it went up the center and down the center at the same time. And it came down around the edges and up around the edges at the same time. My brain likes to see things simplified, but the fact of the matter is it's all beyond my comprehension. And this is all tetrahedra right here. It's just how I look at it. If I want to perceive the vectorness of it, I might grab a, tet a tetrahedron. Anyway, thought I'd share those. Hmm. Shall we continue reading? Yep. Okay. Here we go. A triple. Yes, sir. Triple bond. When three vertexes come together, it is called a fixed bond, a three-point landing. It is like an engineering fixed joint. It is rigid. Triple bonding elucidates both the formational and continuing behaviors of crystalline substances. This also is face bonding. I mean, that the last, the last sentence decide everything. The faces, the minimum face is a triangle, isn't it? Yes. These two faces come together in the bond. There are three vertices that are involved. Actually, for six vertices coming to reducing to three. And yeah. that fixes it. You know, there is no, you don't change it. It's not, the triangle is not compressible, whatever. It is crystal. So probably those two edges should stay in there. There should be both purple and yellow in between those three verti vertices. But that's a triple bond right there. Do you agree? Yeah, that's the original light. Cool. <laughs> Comments, questions? OK, let's continue. Let me see if I can get this. Uh, OK, John, if you want to go for quadruple one. bond. When four vertexes are congruent, we have quadruple bonded densification. The relationship is quadrivalent. Quadribond and mid-edge coordinate tetrahedron systems demonstrate the super strengths of substances 
such as diamonds and metals. This is the way carbon suddenly becomes very dense, as in a diamond. This is multiple self-congruence. Cool. <clears throat> and the diamond is the octahedron. Yes. Yes. There's your quadruple bond. Yes. And mm -hmm. when Bucky does his jitterbug and he compresses the cube octahedron, he compresses it through an icosahedron and then compresses that down into an octahedron, then compresses that down into a tetrahedron that's quadruple bonded tetrahedron. If I remember right. Notice that a quadruple bond is the relationship, the precessive relationship of two tetrahedra. Well, two tetrahedra is triple. No, no, no. Just just show the quadruple bond that you had before. Oh, no, okay. no, no. One inside the other. You can see so, that you have um, the tetrahedra that is the that is green. Yeah, and then the purple. And, that, and that that is blue. The two are related in a way that is perpendicular. In other words, you have one vertex of a tetrahedron coming perpendicularly into one face and through the center of gravity of the other tetrahedron. You, yeah. you, you have that? that you see your yellow, if you look at your yellow outline that shows the octahedron, right. Steve, you can see two tetrahedra that come together like a cross. I, I, I wouldn't use a cross, but they, yeah. they, they intersect at 90 degrees. Yeah. So there's a green tetrahedron and a blue tetrahedron. Intersect at 90, at 90 degrees. They're precisely yeah. intersect. And that is the Merkaba or the, or the uh, star tetrahedron. Okay. Now, when you have that, the outline of that intersection is an octahedron. Yeah. This is, Kelly impressed me with this because every time he showed the tetrahedron, he told a double tetrahedron without the octahedron inside. But that impression landed on me really, really strong. Yeah. The double tetrahedron. And, and actually from one point of view, it almost looks like a square. Yeah, you know, I can see a hinge bond. Yeah, this is where this this whole thing could sit inside of a cube, but the cube is not stable. This sucker is stable, <laughs> and if the cube is stable, it's because this is inside of it. I think I don't know. No, for any cube, for any cube. To be stable, you need to put struts. And usually the strut tends to lend to the cube some of the strength of the, the octahedron that is inside. Yeah. Because the strut, a strut will link one face of the cube to the other in, to an, angle, in an angle. OK. Comments, questions? Let's continue. We're, we seem to be on a roll. What's that? Nelson has yes. a question. In a, in a, in a business, uh, is it um, like uh, aggregate and re aggregate in bulks or ratios? Faster or slow? Is, um, okay. I'm not getting what Nelson's saying. Is his uh, his words are stretching? Anybody hear him? He was talking about uh, fast and slow, though, right? Yes, the the, the motion, the motion is uh, faster in a in, in a business. I think. Uh, it's, it's about the tetrahedron. It's aggregate and re-aggregate. No. Uh, 
I'm not understanding Nelson's question. Is anybody or his comment? Anybody understand what he's saying? I have a hard time hearing. <coughs> Forgive me, Nelson. Nelson speak in Spanish and and um, Rafael will translate. Yes, means right. Okay, yes. Well, I can not hear him very well, but I think what he's trying to say is that as, as you aggregate and re-aggregate, you can have a more speed or less speed as you do that. That's his point. As you aggregate and re-aggregate, you can have more speed or less speed. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that one, that's what he's saying. Yes. That's correct, Nelson. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, okay. We're going to share some words. Oops, I got graphics in the way. There we and go. That's, and that speed, that speed, Nelson, can be connotated with momentum. Yes. The notion of momentum. Yes, thank you, Manny. Can you guys all see this? Yes. Yes. I'm trying to bucky eyes my. Uh, my dictionary in my <laughs> <laughs> go ahead john if you would like i think okay. here, right <clears throat> yep the behavioral hierarchy of bondings is integrated four dimensionally with the synergies of mass interactions and precession wow my examples of Torah really fit into that paragraph don't they hmm. yeah comments questions I think we've commented it. We've commented on this just good. before that. Hmm. All right, good. You want to continue? Let's see. Yeah. You've gone too far. That's right. Stop there. Quadrivalence. Yes, Quadrivalence please. of energy structures closer than sphere packing. In 1885, Van Hoff showed that all organic chemical structuring is tetrahedrally configured and interaccounted in vertexial linkage. A constellation of tetrahedra linked together entirely by such single bonded universal jointing uses lots of space, which is the openmost condition of flexibility and mutability characterizing the behavior of gases. The medium packed condition of a double bonded hinged arrangement is still flexible, but sum totally as an aggregate all space filling complex is non comprehensible as are liquids. The closest packing triple bonded fixed end arrangement corresponds with rigid structure molecular compounds. Right. <clears throat> I don't okay. know Van Hoff. Does anybody know him and what he did? No. Nope. Nope. I'll do some research on that for next week. I've heard the but, name, but, but I, I'm just, trying to remember. Yeah, I mean, Independently of what uh, what uh, Van ha Van Huff did, what 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 uh, Bucky is saying there, just summarizing the whole of the thing that he described further up, and and that link, you know, like 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 the gases, and we've been talking in, in when we talk about the structure about the most expanded structure. We we'll talk about that and the link to that to the gas in terms of bonding. So you just in terms of it depends on the language that you're talking about. You can either talk structure or you can either talk bond, but the two are equivalent. To the most expanded structure, your analogy in terms of bonding would be gases. To the medium, you know, expanded structure, the medium structure is would be liquid, double bonded. And to the, the crystal, or it will be all the tetrahedron, it will be um, uh, 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 
um, crystals. So there is a there is a there is a hierarchy there. So in bonding, you can have the same hierarchy as we talk about in terms of structures, in terms of vegetable. You remember that? I think that's very from the vector equilibrium down, 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 down to the four bonded tetrahedron. Yeah, let's do the let's do the jitterbug and see if it means something more now than it did before. Here, uh, shall we go ahead and show that, or shall we have a discussion before I show it? I think it's a great way to end the call. So, if we have more discussion, because he mentions bonding and compression, and and there are a couple of things. Where I actually spent about four hours on that video, and I actually scripted it, and I actually have drawn little pictures like at one point he talks about diamonds and he talks about ridge pole diamonds i don't understand what he was talking about but it seems he's talking about rhombus a rhombus which has a phi ratio in it which the octahedron seems to have and as he collapses uh, there's a lot of cool things going on shall we watch the victor actually let's watch the victor Act libra are we ready for that yeah here we, here we go share screen and full screen no, I got junk in the way here. Sound and roll. That's packing right there. That's packing. Now the radii have been removed. That is explosives. And it is equilibrium is, is a very a completely unstable condition. <laughs> that is, when uh, when we first had submarines, we used to fill the water ballast tanks so it was just at equilibrium. <laughs> and then, if anybody happened to just drop a monkey wrench, so we could throw the balance out and they would tend to nose over and, and get into radio trouble. When we began flying, then we came to what we call the star. <laughs> the star is the point when equilibrium at the start, anything can happen, can go at any kind of a spin. Nature upholds that equilibrium. She always, everything you and I know will always be one side or the other of the equilibrium. At any rate, this is the most expansive form of the of these vectors that I gave you. Now here's vector equilibrium. Can can you can everybody see this all right? Can we stop there, Steve? I'm going to just take a comment. A face. What's that, Manu? Yes, just a comment for, for us to understand very well. He talked about the most expanded form, but you see that, do you see the triangles? Yes. There are mm -hmm. triangles here, but there's a yes. square here. This triangle at that surface yeah. is, is a face of a tetrahedron, right? Right. Yes. <laughs> so when you see, look at those triangles, they are linked by what? Just one vector. Do you see that? Right. Mm. Don't see the square, see the triangle. Yeah. Okay. In a minute, in a minute, that's critical because when he collapses this, it goes into an icosahedron. And yes. at that point, he says those squares actually turn into triangles. Yes. 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 Says, you'll hear him say you can kind of see that, right? Yes. Well, and you, he'll say, he'll uh, he'll say, just add six edges or six vectors. We add six vectors and we get an icosahedron. You'll hear him say that. Go ahead. But, but what, what I want to draw attention to is that what is not compressible is that triangle. Right. And everything that is yes. out, out there is space for it to move. You see the window, the square window is space within the system yeah. for it to move. All right? And, and if this were all triangles, it would not be vector equilibrium. Exactly. All right. Yeah, vector equilibrium is the space that nature abhors. You and I never see vector equilibrium. We see what's on either side of it. That's what he just said. Okay, here we go. And lower towards the face on the floor. And this top triangle is not allowed to twist. 
only approach the triangle on the floor. You've got two planes approaching each other. You understand? I get, I, we can make a big deal of it, but see this triangle is pointing towards us. Mm -hmm. That triangle is pointing towards him. And mm -hmm. those two will, ne that relationship will never change. Imagine an axis going down through this from the center of this face to the center of this face and these two never twisting. Everything else turns. It's, thought, it's defined there. There is defined what you call the pole. Right. The polar pair. That's what it defined. Every system needs poles in order to define, that is the reference in order to define the motion or the position later on. And that is in the relationship, Euler relationship is the two that you have there, that is left, the two. Wait a minute, did you say Euler relationship? Yes, Euler relationship. Between okay. vertexes, faces, and edges. There's always two remaining. Faces plus vertices minus edge edges equal two for any system. Okay. Faces plus vertices minus edges is equal two. That is the two that is fixed there. You say yep. the two triangles, one in the north, the other in the south, are not allowed to twist. He says so. OK. So even when they collapse, there's one triangle up here, <laughs> one triangle down there. That's the two-ness. Here we go. So this means this vertex will always be towards you. Yeah. And vertex in the floor is towards me. So I'm going to do this. Suddenly, it's collapsed around. The squirrel are changing. They become diamonds. Then ridgepole diamonds. Now the distance between the the vertexes is such that the line is exactly the same as the. Other. Sound went out. We lost the sound. Yeah, I thought it was just me. Mm -hmm. Good thing it has captions. Yeah, it's just... <laughs> yeah, exactly. You thought what was just you? The sound. Yeah, it's, it's all distorted. That's fine. It, it's, not, actually, it's not as if I understand them anyway. Well, and I actually found like one or two little things where I don't think he was saying what the captions said. Pretty close. Oh, well, that's a right. problem. Yeah, and it is a problem. So when that square squishes, it becomes a diamond and he starts talking about diamonds. Yeah. Yeah, and that's where you get the icosahedron shape. And I'll, uh, I can pull up an icosahedron. Uh, maybe I can do it right now uh, so that you can see what, because it's all blurry, it's out of focus there. Icosahedron. Mm. Oh, I'm in the wrong place, sorry. Whoop, I've got bonding and I don't want- It might bond. be interesting that we see the, the video to the end, Steve. Yeah, I wanna show you. This is an icosahedron. Yes, that's a so, diamond as well. So that this was a square. And then that's where he says, we're gonna add vectors in there. We're gonna add six vectors. So we take the squares and we turn them into triangles, and, and this is a diamond or a rhombus, in fact. Yes. And there's a relationship between that and the octahedron. So what you're gonna see as he collapses it. So let's go ahead and, I don't mind stopping it because I stopped it. God, Another set of vectors, six more introduced, or one more unit of quantum. Now I'm gonna keep lowering that triangle. Total on the floor, not twisting at all. And now it suddenly contracts to become the octahedron. Mm. Yeah. That's the right beautiful thing you watch. All vertexes approach common center at a, a common rate. It's absolutely symmetrical expansion 
comes back up here and now contracts the other way. Now, in, in a minute, he's going to talk about the tetrahedron pumping, as what he's saying is the octahedron is pumping. Everything's pumping. The, the axis in my hands never rotates. Only the, only the cradle is rotating. There he pumps it again. Now, I can go, supposing this is rotating in space, with the stars, there's a, a mass, there's a mass attraction pull of another set of stars, and one then this is trying to turn, and then it restrains this. It, what, what happens? He says this is trying to turn. So, so I'm assuming he's saying that that vector equilibrium cube octahedron is actually spinning, and there's a group of stars over there that are influencing it, and it's spinning. And now here's what that group of stars does to it. So when you do that, would be then. I'm going to back that up. Another sorry. Stars, there's, a, a mass, there's a mass attraction pull of another set of stars. And one then, this is trying to turn, and then it restrains this. It, what, what happens when you do that would be then, I move this around, it forces it to contract. If it's being forced to contract that way, then remember, notice it's rotating this way. This rotates more and plunges right through. And it comes the tetrahedron. It goes it goes flat on the floor there for a minute, and that's where you see the triangle. But the triangle is not a structure, it's a shape. The structures uh -huh. are the tetrahedron, the octahedron, the icosahedron, and the vector equilibrium. Those are structures. That I just thought I'd I'd point that out. Here we go. Remember, notice it's rotating this way. This rotates more and plunges right through. And it comes the tetrahedron. We've gone all the way from vector equilibrium, icosahedron, octahedron, vector equilibrium. The octahedron is double bonded, tetrahedron is quadruple bonded, quadrivalent, we call it. This way, diamonds are in respect to carbon. <clears throat> we have no, no point to break open. So the maximum space employed by unity is, is a vector equilibrium. But all the structures are within it. <laughs> they're they're co contracted wrong from the whole. Now notice that this can then tetrahedron. I, I had it plunge that through like that. This can then immediately reverse itself and tetrahedron just turn inside out. <laughs> that way. Just does it absolutely spontaneous. Yeah. Okay. I, this is really critical. This is the convex concave. This is the visible and the non visible. As, it, as this thing plunges. We see the one part, but we don't see the other. I, I had it plunge that through like that. This can then immediately reverse itself and set the heat and just turn it inside out. That way. <laughs> just as it absolutely spontaneously. Basic pumping. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> that, that, that identifies vector equilibrium and introduces a hierarchy of accounting. And that hierarchy of accounting is, of course, the cube octahedron to the icosahedron to the octahedron to the tetrahedron, and all of it is pumping and expanding. Questions, comments? Was that helpful to see that again? I'll tell you, every time I watch it, I got something else out of it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think there are many, many things there that are important to kind of fix in our minds going forward. The one was you always need a referential, the axis, the poles. Right. Every system is polar. Right? The second one that I got is that once you have those poles, that is your reference, that is the thing that's not going to change. What is happening is that the influence of those, of other structures, or other bodies outside of you, because you have fixed those, is going to make you spin. It's going to make you hinge. So initially, by choice, boom, we have the pole, and then there is always influence. There's always energy around, in, through, or this is. This is going to result automatically in the spinning, 
right? And because I have this structure and the others are moving, the orbiting is also, is like a dwell of a spin. <laughs> right on. Let's capture that next week as it's yeah. time to draw to a close. <laughs> so Robert, do you want to, you started, do you want to close it? Yeah, absolutely. So um, Nelson, how do you feel and what's your takeaway today? Thank you, Rafa. Uh, I feel uh, well. Thank you for this call. And uh, I try to take away. Uh, I learned more about uh, the law of, uh, of um, momentum. Thank you, Rafa. Uh, no, uh, John, but uh, how do you feel and how do you take away? That was me. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Nelson. Um, yeah, I'm feeling um, provoked, thought-wise, and um, it was good to think about the different shapes and the nature of the bonding and the relationships. I still don't think I've absorbed it and comprehended it unconsciously, so I'm still thinking about it consciously. Um, yeah, I do like the geometry. I do like the tetrahedra and um, yeah, no, well worthwhile. Thank you. So thinking, um, Susan, so how do you feel and what do you take out of today? I'm feeling like this is probably the sixth time we've been over this since I've been in it. And I feel like I actually am much more comfortable with it. Finally, um, I really do like understanding that it's all about defining the boundaries on the system. It's defining the poles on the system. It's defining the reference point from which you're viewing the system to begin to understand the relationships and interrelationships. And I'm sure I'll take more out of it going forward. Um, I'm kind of disappointed that we didn't get to the enough time to talk about what we're gonna do next, but we'll figure it out. Joseph, how do you feel and what are you taking away? Um, thank you, Susan. Um, I don't know, I got an echo there for a moment. Um, you know, I, I'm, what I'm taking away is a better understanding of bonding within systems specifically. Uh, that, that is something that uh, I'm going over. And as well, I also, the one of my major takeaways is when Manu would, referred to that we always need poles and actually looking at the jitterbug within that context. Um, the importance of calibration and boundaries as well uh, is something I feel like I feel like a little bit more comfortable with than than I than I did coming in. Um, and just understanding, you know, single, double and triple bonds. Uh, I mean, I, that, that's I'm still not clear on that. That's something I need to uh, get complete on, um, as uh, as uh, Steve would say. And uh, but um, it was a good call. It was a good call, and uh, I really appreciate everybody, um, you know, uh, showing me specifically their magnets in the beginning, uh, starting with the aces. And, uh, so um, very much appreciate everybody. Uh, everybody's participation in the call today. Um, glad Kelly made it through the whole call and it's good to have you back on a regular basis as well. Um, Manu, how are you, my friend? How do you feel? And what are you taking away from today? I, I, I feel a lot better than I thought I would feel during this call because really, you know, I'm not used to having sleep at least. But um, I think it's very important. Thank you all. Thanks, Steve, again. And thank everybody for giving your best into this. <clears throat> what I take away from here is, is, is actual fact, the design of thought. Mm. Because there we, we, we touch on the notion of boundary, energy that is always there flowing in, out, around. We talk about referential poles. We talk about system interacting, always interacting. And we talk about the hierarchy of that interaction. 
without forgetting that we talk about the prerequisite for it is that you have to be able to calibrate from the fact that it is something that is repeatable, that is repeating. So, um, and, and, and then there was really, really, to me, I don't know in an epiphany, uh, epiphany, but something that's not usually, they taught us in geology that rocks are inert, right? But it's not inert. It is just a form of life that is locked very tightly and that will evolve into something else, right? So that is something that really into, when we designing and we know these kind of things, it really helps us into doing better with less. That's what I take away from here. You know, without really understanding the complexity and how the principle to me and the hope is that we can do better with less and we are doing better with less. So that's what I take away from here. Um, who hasn't been? Kelly, how do you feel? What do you take away? Uh, how do I feel? Uh, it's hard to say. Uh, I got through the call. Uh, that makes me happy. Um, yeah, it, it, it's, I, I, I don't really know what I took away from it, but I knew, no, I took away something. So there you go. Um, Raffers, how do you feel and what do you take away? Um, thank you, Kelly. Not really feel great, great call. What I take away is, again, this great application of um, you know, getting information, uh, getting our brains to store and retrieve, and then relate and interrelate, because we related very nicely when we studied around spheres and angles and you know, 360 degrees, et cetera, into bonding and the jitterbug. So, and that relating and interrelating created, created, in my case, more clarity. Again, I don't fully understand, I mean, many of Bucky's concepts, but again, I have a greater understanding or, or much closer understanding to what he's trying to say than I did before this course. So I was grateful for that. And the great power of this course and, and what we discuss and, and again, how we bond together as a group so I can relate that as well how each of us is a sphere and how, as we relate to each other, we create bonds, metaphysical bonds, actually, as well as physical bonds. And that, through a, and that happens through a, a call, a connection of many different points on the planet. So that's always great to have. So very grateful for that. Um, so I guess it's you left, Steve. So Steve, how yeah. do you feel and what's your takeaway? Well, I'll tell you. Talking about all these bonds, having gotten these magnets, these are magnets. These balls are just steel balls. Mm -hmm. This whole conversation is so much more meaningful to me because there is so much power in that thing right there. Yeah. And this thing spinning around until you, until I held this crap in my hands and not realize how this energy is so interactive and so everywhere precessioning. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden there's a bond. And the nature of that energy changes. The, these magnets were absolutely critical for me to understand that. And to understand that this is a tetrahedron, oh. And to understand that a tetrahedron is four of these frickers with energy going every frickin' which way, concave and convex, visible and subvisible. <clears throat> I actually think that my brain is changing. I think these calls are changing my brain. I am so grateful for being invited to these calls. Um, wow. Uh, and so, uh, and we have just a couple minutes. We, in, the, in, in the email that went out, we talked about the possibility of like looking for more input on what you want to discuss next. Now, we've gone from these structures to bonding. I think we could spend a little bit more time on the bonding and the jitterbug and the icosahedron. I think we really can do that. But it would be good to take up some other topics. One consideration was, and I haven't, I don't wanna put anybody on the spot, so I'm not gonna say anything. 
So if you have a topic that you think somebody who hasn't been attending would be interested in, put it out here, uh, especially if you want to present. But if you don't want to present, that's okay, because we'll figure something out. Just make a good suggestion, okay? You guys, nowhere do I get this relationship. Nowhere, nowhere. All the entire universe is energy connected. There is there is entanglement everywhere I go. And my body thinks I'm separate from you. And then all I have to do is remember nothing is separate. Everything is freaking connected. And I'm so honored to be with each of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you each for sure. Yes. And you're two minutes early. So that's good. Two minutes. <laughs> 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 hey, bye bye everybody bye, bye, bye that was even with a rant at the end of it raffers i even ranted at the end we're still two minutes early. <laughs> that's good yeah um but that's yeah. that was that was good though yeah that was a good call yeah cool. great thank you